And of course, we all start out as little babes. We got to grow and learn. But down in the heart, it's going to be real. And you'll confess him. You'll do it. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now, I can't dwell on this subject very long, but I want to tell you that as you study this subject, you need to put this teaching and connect it with the reality of rejecting Jesus Christ. Because it is the Spirit. You know, Jesus, when he worked with uh, those scribes and Pharisees, they came and listened to him and, and they did. Some of them, I'm afraid, some of them blasphemed. But what they were doing is they had the tremendous witness of the spirit as Jesus ministered in miracles. And remember, Jesus Christ ministered as the perfect spirit filled son of man. He was always God incarnate, but he chose to perform his ministry in the power of of the Holy Spirit. When he came out of the wilderness after being tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible says he returned in the power of the Spirit. Now the Holy Ghost was upon him. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed. I think it was John who said he had the Spirit without measure. You talk about convicting power. You, if you had ever heard a sermon by Jesus Christ, brother, there'd have been some fire burning in your soul. I guarantee you that. And this tremendous witness in this tremendous light, these men began to speak against Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something, my friend. This is still real today. And when God's church carries the gospel forward in the power of the Spirit and you start speaking against it, watch out. That's dangerous. You might speak a word against Jesus, but when you get to that point where you're finally saying, I don't want nothing to do with him, and that blasphemy starts coming out of your mouth. See, this is connected to a final rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God bears witness, church. It's the Spirit. The Holy Ghost bears witness. You remember when they stoned Stephen to death? And Stephen stirred him up big time. He said, just like our fathers, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, just like our fathers. And brother, the Spirit was working with, but they did resist the Spirit. And I don't know how many of them might have rejected Christ for the last time, but it's a dangerous thing. And just know this, when you commit this sin, you'll never be forgiven. Be careful. One thing I've learned about this subject, when you get to that point, if you ever do, God forbid, when you get there, you'll never desire to ever be saved. You'll never be drawn again. Did you know Jesus said, a man can't come to me except my father draw him? You can't, you can't come. You know, Brother Ron, we'd have never had a desire. We were going our own way, but the Spirit came. He worked with our hearts, and we said yes. Well, when the Lord works with us and He draws us, then we can be saved. Now, if you ever commit this sin, you cross that line, you commit this sin, you'll never have that impulse again. Now, that's what I've learned. Now, maybe some of you have learned more about it than I have, but I'll just share what I know. And uh, be careful. You need to be careful. I shudder sometimes. I hear people speak against Christianity and speak against the Lord. And I say, oh, my, they might be going too far. Dad, they might be going too far. Lord, help them. Verse 11. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. That really is exemplified in the lives of the apostles in the book of Acts. You can see it then. But the Lord will do that to this very day uh, with his people. Verse 13, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> of all the things you could come and talk to King Jesus about. I mean, Kevin, he's, they got an audience with the son of the living God and the man wants him to, to part. To, would you speak to my brother? He won't share part of the inheritance with me. Really? That, that's what you want to talk? Okay. Well, Jesus, let's see what he said. Verse 14. He said unto him, Man, <laughs> who made me a judge or a divider over you? Well, <clears throat> you say, well, didn't Jesus have the authority? Well, he's the son of God. He, he certainly uh, rules over all. 
But in the immediate context, Jesus is basically saying, that's none of my business. You take that to the other people uh, and, and they'll deal with that. I, I'm not here to take care of all your little business. But, but now it doesn't mean the Lord didn't care, but there's something a whole lot more important that he turns our heart toward. And he said unto him, take heed. Now, see, Jesus, when people would come to talk to him, he would know their heart. He would know the motivation. He knew what was in this man's heart. And here this man wants him to divide this inheritance. Why? Because he's got a spiritual problem. And Christ speaks to it immediately. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. I think every Christian ought to memorize this verse. Get it down in your spirit and actually live by it. If Jesus Christ says, beware of something, you need to set up and take note. Beware of covetousness. Watch out. What is covetousness? You know what it is. It's greed. It also manifests as stinginess. Covetousness, the New Testament says, is idolatry because it displaces God from first place in your heart and life. It gets ugly real quick. Covetousness is a sin. The 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet. There's a lot of territory covered here. And Jesus said, now you beware. Now in this context, he's talking about money and possessions. Uh, not, you know, uh, other areas uh, that this might apply to, but specifically possessions, money, wealth. And he says, now look, beware of covetousness. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Now, the world around us lives just the opposite of that verse. Because you would think all of life was wrapped up in finally climbing to the top of the hill. Bless the Lord, I finally got a piece of the pie. I'm living the American dream. Well, what is that? I'm just wondering, what, what would that be? People define it different ways. I can tell you one thing. You cannot define your life by the size of your bank account, how big your house is, or all, all those possessions you have. And you gotta be really careful that those things don't take your heart. Now Jesus isn't done. He goes on, he gives us a powerful example. And he spake a parable unto them saying, verse 16, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty, plentifully. Now the old boy was already well off. I mean, he's doing well. And there's nothing wrong with having things, but there's something horribly wrong with things having you. And that's the problem. All right, now he says the brown, his rich man brought forth plenty. In verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Now, when you read this short few verses, you might just try to count how many times this old boy talks about I and my. I mean, he's so self-centered. He's as self-centered as the day is long. And he says, I thought, he thought within himself, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns. I'll build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. Hmm. This night thy soul shall be required of thee then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now there's a whole lot of folk in our world that as far as the world is concerned, they have a little bit. They might even think of themselves as being rich. Uh, some are truly rich. But are they rich towards God? Now, I would say to all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, be careful. You're living in the world, but you're not of the world. You're of a different spirit. You have different priorities. Um, you don't want to live like the world lives. Now, as you're prospering over time, when you learn the grace of giving and you start seeking first the kingdom and you experience God's faithfulness and over time, if it pleases the Lord to put into your care a certain amount of wealth, you've got to guard your, your heart. God's called you to march to the drum of a, a different drum beat, okay? And you're of a different spirit. 
Uh, I'll say this without apology. I, I mention it different times, but the Lord God has not called his people into the barn building business. He didn't say you couldn't have plenty. This old boy had plenty. He didn't say he couldn't prosper. This old boy was prospering, but he didn't know what to do with it. It took his heart. One of the things we studied in our series, you know, I had it up on the big screen last week, I think, but, you know, as you prosper over time, and in our circumstances are all different, and we want to be faithful where God's put us and with what he's entrusted us with. So to whom much is given, much is required. So, you know, uh, somebody might be entrusted with more possession and opportunity and wealth than I have. They'll be accountable for much. Maybe I have a little less. I'm going to be account accountable where God put me. But you see, at some point, especially as you're moving along, you may have to decide where enough is enough. Now, I've heard Larry Burkett when he was uh, here before he went home to be with the Lord. Other brothers say this. Uh, you have to decide when you've saved enough. OK, you've got one barn filled. You've got enough. Uh, and you've 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 been wise. You're, you've been giving and being led by the spirit. God's still blessing you. You get out of debt over time. You're increased. You're in a greater place of freedom. You're still prospering. And you're saying, you know what? God's filled my barn. And he's still blessing me. My, my ground is bringing forth more, so to speak. You've got a decision to make. You, only, you can only go two ways. You can either take that surplus and use it to God's glory, or you can go into the barn building business. <laughs> What's it going to be? Jesus doesn't want you in the barn building, but you know what? You say, what's he want me to do with it? He wants you to be rich in good works. Did you know that the New Testament teaches me as a pastor, one of my pastoral responsibilities, you can read about it in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I have a responsibility to charge you that are rich. Not to trust in uncertain riches, but to be rich in good works. Translated, preacher, Tell God's people to use what God has put in their hands to his glory and stay out of the barn building business. How about that? Oh, well, I got to raise my voice a little bit, keep you from going to sleep on an evening session like this. You're liable to fall off on me. All right. All right. So does everybody get the, the uh, power of this? Uh, lay up your treasure in heaven. See, when you get enough and you say boy the lord continues oh he's trusting you you're a steward it's his he put it in your hands it's not yours use it to his glory don't let it get power over you man just abound be a happy hilarious joyful giver be rich in good works you say well my goodness if i live like that i might give half of what i got away what ain't yours it's the lord's and yes you might be you might you couldn't do that maybe when you first got married but maybe later in life you can and again, it may never be quite that away, but you got to pay attention to how God's blessed you and you got to guard your heart so that you don't go after things. Um, I'm going to leave it there. There's more to say, but uh, let the word speak to you. Listen to the Lord. It's his word. And I wouldn't know exactly how God might be speaking to you during this lesson, but you mind him. Verse 22, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. In other words, don't be anxious and worried. You know, some people that have plenty, they, they're still ate up with anxiety and worry like they're not going to have enough for tomorrow. And so they get into the barn building business because of that. They can't never have quite enough because they're, they're always worried and fearful. Don't you folks have some faith? Don't you have some faith tonight? I, I, I believe you do. I believe you have a trust in the Lord. Uh, Brother Darrell, I believe the Lord will take care of us. I don't know what's going to happen in this mess.